Take care, everyone. Take care. Take care. How's everyone doing, Mike? Yeah, very well. It's like a nice morning here, California. <laughs> you almost teetered on as always the weather. But I'm glad you didn't, Chris. But then we, we talk about the weather on this show. Yeah, good, nice, nice finish to the week. Uh, good to good to do this on a Friday. Actually, um, normally we, uh, we 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 record on different days, but it's nice to have this uh, talk uh, at the end of the end of a working week. Grounds me going into the weekend. Chris, Chris is having some internet troubles because he's deep in the Amazon rainforest. So if he um, mm-hmm. if he cuts Chris out robotic. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, then we know I'll, why. I'll be going into Samadhi states or something, just <laughs> frozen. Yeah. So today we're discussing minute twenty-four of the movie *The Life Awake: The Life of Yogananda*. <clears throat> minute twenty-four is uh, in the film. It's not such an important minute i don't think the way they've portrayed it but in the hearts and minds of all yoga and the devotees around the world and every single fan of the auto- autobiography of a yogi this is perhaps one of the most pivotal sections and uh, most important points of the autobiography of a yogi really pro- pro- probably the one of the most moving for me as well personally so this uh, is talking about of course uh, yogananda's meeting his first meeting with his uh, guru sri yukteswar um and the miraculous events that leading that lead up to that moment and uh, a bit beyond that moment so we'll talk about how the film has portrayed that um scene by scene um we'll so let's start with um the amulet so what happens just before this um this scene actually is yogananda is um is meditating and something happens with his amulet um and we'll talk briefly about what an amulet is um we might we might as well do it now actually so the amulet that yogananda had was um given to him by his brother ananta and uh, the amulet has uh, in its own uh, way a miraculous story as to how it came into passing to Yogananda. So what happened was a year before this uh, momentous day when, when Yogananda was 17 and his, he met his guru, um, Ananda had given him the uh, amulet and he, he was really reluctantly gave it to him because what happened was his mother previously, um, she, uh, she was... Um, she was somewhere and someone came to some some knock on the door someone came to knock on the door and, and said i need to see the mother of yogananda and this intrigued her and she said okay yeah fine come and see me and then and then she, this this sadhu or mystic kind of came in and said dear mother this um this next ill you, you're about to have an illness and it's going to be the last um last you know last phase of your life and um and to 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 kind of give you assurance that I'm telling you the truth in a few days um, a talisman or an amulet will appear in your hands and and that's that's pretty much what happened and he further instructed her saying that um, you must instruct your eldest son to pass this amulet onto your son Mukunda and that that is uh, pretty much what happened Um, and Ananda reluctantly gave his brother the amulet because he didn't want to further you know increase his um his his younger brother's ardor and you know desire to to leave home so quite a magic magical um story and yogananda was obviously quite emotional in receiving this uh, amulet mike what are your thoughts about that particular part of this, the, the the autobiography yeah th- that was one of the first moments in the book i mean it happens relatively early on where something completely I mean maybe not the first time but something completely supernatural happens she meditates and then she opens her hands and there's the amulet Mm. and um which is pretty great and then um his brother still even though this happened still thinking 
Uh, I'd rather not give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> Those kind of how he was um, on complete, at least at this point in his life, um, very much on the other side of this. Um, I was thinking often that the meaning of giving it to the mother in the same sentence as telling her that she's going to pass on, that she's going to pass away. And so I thought maybe it was supposed to be her role to introduce um, Mokunda to his new guru, but she isn't able in this lifetime because her life is short. So the amulet is going to take that role from her. I'm not sure if you guys ever thought that. A really good, uh, good uh, bit of insight there. Uh, Chris, so actually I just checked and um, the, this this incident with his mother took place in Lahore in Punjab and um, and in the dialogue for the movie one of the one of the one of the sections was um, she kind of says farewell my child the cosmic mother will will prove will protect you and that is directly taken from the autobiography yogi and from this section where his mother is saying that to um, Ananda and Mukunda so Chris what were your thoughts about that amulet story? But what strikes me is the, the grace of how it's told and the um, the whole family really being enlightened is more clear to me in hearing this story than reading the story. I think if you were to have that scenario happen to, let's say, any any kind of regular folk, I, I'd include myself in that description. <laughs> you know, you might you might be a little bit more kind of alarmed or, you know, you, you might not take it with such faith and grace is, is uh, what, what it was taken uh, with by, by uh, Yogananda and his mother and, and his brother. So uh, it, it's magical, isn't it? What can you say? It's, uh, it's incredible um, to, 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 to read. And part of the mysticism and the magic of the, uh, the autobiography of a yogi for me was, you know, looking at this chapter and simply imagining all the possibilities of the things that we don't know in life and how what things are possible and um, in, in the autobiography here it says um, uh, Yogananda uh, was, was uh, looking at the uh, amulet and it had Sanskrit characters written all over and it was very ancient and uh, he said that there was further significance to to the amulet that maybe what he described but he said one does not re reveal fully mm -hmm. the heart of an amulet mm -hmm. it's just so it's so uh, cheeky isn't it you know it's so, so great <laughs> love it um and it just fuels my imagination and, and my my desire to know more my my longing to uh, follow in the footsteps of, of such uh, a master and, and lineage yes when when yogananda received it he says a blaze of illumination came over me with the possession of the amulet many dormant yeah. memories awakened um yeah, yeah so so it's quite uh, quite nice and he says uh, but the small boy referring to himself thwarted in his thwarted in his attempts to reach the himalayas daily traveled far on the wings of the amulet <laughs> which is very nice um but yeah as you as you said chris uh, there was sanskrit inscribed in it um and later in the autobiography of a yogi, I think he describes an amulet as an astrally produced product or object. Um, it's structurally evanescent, um, and such objects must finally disappear from our earth. Um, and Chris, I think you mentioned previously, it's like Harry Potter has taken the magical elements of such things in, in their uh, books, and no other, no doubt, other um, other other films that have magical lore and stories such as this and when you when, when when you said that for me I, I thought of the elder wand and other things like that <laughs> from harry potter yeah. and, and the rings in the lord of the rings you know the, yeah. the the words inscribed but obviously this one would be for good you know <laughs> for good purposes <laughs> yes 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 and mike was there was mike there was another amulet story i believe in the autobiography of a yogi yeah, way later when Guruji goes to India um, and then comes back, he bring he there's like a big reception at Mother Center, and each of the devotees gets like a little package, a little gift that Guruji brought from India, and then there's this devotee. His name is Mr. Dickinson. He receives a silver cup, and he 
he starts crying or he, he starts becoming very emotional. And then a few days later, they talk, Guruji and Mr. Dickinson, and then he tells him that when he was five years old, he was with his mother in Chicago. And um, so even earlier in his life, he, he was pushed in a, he was like with his brother out in nature and he was pushed in a, in a river or in a stream or something. Um, and it took minutes before he could get out, before one of his friends saved him by handing him a branch, a tree branch or something. And while he was underwater, he saw a light and then he saw the face of, of someone, um, of like a Swami or like a guru, but he didn't know who it was. And then when he was in, when he was in Chicago with his mother, um, they saw someone walking down the street and going into a convention center. And he said to his mom, this is the guy that I saw when I was underwater. And then they went on to see the, the, the guru uh, or the convention. The, and he gave a talk there. And it was Swami Vivekananda. And then afterwards, they walked up to him. And the boy asked him, like, if um, um, no, he thought maybe this is, person is going to be my master. And Vivekananda said, I'm not your master. But your master will come and he will give you a silver cup. And then when he received a silver cup from Guruji, even 10, 15 years after he had already been his disciple, it just all came together for him. So the silver cup in this instance was like kind of like the amulet for him. Another it didn't disappear, but yeah. yeah. Another magical, magical story. And this one really, that story really emphasized for me the, you know, my wife always says this, she, she feels like all the gurus are, you know, connected to each other in like a, a guru wide mm -hmm. web, not a worldwide web, <laughs> a guru area network, <laughs> something along those lines. Chris? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty awesome story and it makes me, makes me think of the connection you know my connection with Yogananda and you know the um the journeys that you know we all go through individually and um how they're all unique but they're all meaningful in in the way that is appropriate for the individual the complexity of that and um uh, I guess the, pers the the personal journey that we all have is is really special uh, and yeah, there's so many little stories like this in the autobiography and outside um, that are just, yeah, re really great. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's lovely to hear. So let's uh, go back to the film. The film now kind of the narrator says um, before, before Mukunda goes to the market, he says, um, I wiped my tear tear swollen face so he was crying uh, let, let's explore from the so in, in the film it doesn't just explain why he was um why he was you know teary or crying so let, let's go let's go into that um and this of course um he was actually in uh Adayananda's ashram so this is when he when he when he'd passed his um school and he'd you know openly openly uh, told his father he was leaving home and he, he came to come came across this uh this saint Dayananda and the ashram so he decided to join with his with a couple of his friends and the the ashram was entitled the Mahamandal Hermitage and interestingly it was in the same neighborhood as the Lahiri Mahasha family home um which is not uh interestingly Yog uh, Yogananda Mukunda would have known that but he doesn't at the time, but he doesn't mention that in the autobiography of Yogi, and um, he was there for um, for six months, which is quite interesting, isn't it? I wonder if he um, he went there. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, from from other biographies, it's uh, said that the ashram ethos was evidently one of karma yoga, a path whose emphasis was on service, work, and discipline is meant to subordinate the ego and attune the disciple to the consciousness of the guru and through him divine intelligence. Mukunda was more aligned with the meditative accent of Raja Yoga 
and the devotion of bhakti yoga. So let's um, now uh, talk about Yogananda's experiences in the ashram. So um, when he would, uh, when he would um, meditate in the attic of the ashram, Chris, do you want to read out? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, from where, from which side? Don't do I do? don't try we, to we catch. Some, don't try yeah. to catch God so this soon. Is, this is the, the ridicule from a, a fellow resident accompanied one of my early departures toward the attic. I went to Dayananda, busy in his small sanctum overlooking the Ganges. And Dayananda said, uh, a, little, a second injunction for your disciple, uh, discipline concerns food, even when you feel hunger, don't mention it. Swamiji, I am puzzled about, your fo about following your instruction. Suppose I never ask for food and nobody gives me any. I should starve to death. Die then, this alarming consul split the air. Die if you must, Mukunda. Never believe that you live by the power of food and not by the power of God. He who has created every form of nourishment, he who has bestowed appetite, will inevitably see that his devotee is maintained. So it, it, this is something really that Yogananda uh, talks about himself quite a bit, you know, in the teachings of SRF um, and uh, to taking from the ether around you through the process of meditation, your sustenance. Um, so one of the early lessons that I'm sure stuck with Yogananda throughout his years. So quite, quite interesting to read. Yeah, Mike, do you want to read the next bit? Do not imagine that rice sustains you, nor that money or men support you. Could they aid if the Lord withdraws your life breath? They are his instruments merely. It is by any skill of yours that food digests in your stomach. Use the sword of discrimination, Mukunda. Cut through the chains of agency and perceive the single cause. I found his incisive words entering some deep marrow. Gone was an age-old illusion by which bodily imperatives outwit the soul. Then and there I tasted the spirit's all-sufficiency. In how many strange cities in my later life of ceaseless travel did occasion arise to prove the serviceability of the lessons in the Benares Hermitage? Um, yeah, so that was... Um, so he, he went through, so Leonanda would um, try and, you know, help his uh, devotee in various ways. But uh, obviously there was a few instances where they, they clashed and this was one of them. And when other other devotees in the, in the ashram would complain that, you know, he's meditating too much there and then they would mm -hmm. say, let him, let him meditate, you know, he'll learn our ways. Um, so he, he used to often support him and rebuke him. So not everything in the, the ashram was, uh, was, was negative per se. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember, what, yeah, I remember, sorry. Yeah. I remember when, when I read this, it wasn't all plain sailing, was it, you know, as, as uh, we see so many really inspiring stories um, in Mukunda's younger life. And, uh, you know, he, he uh, to a point of a conversation we had last week with Mark, sorry, that I'm getting attacked by a fly here <laughs> as, I, as I talk. <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to have, what is it, non-fly conscious. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Rid yourself of mosquito consciousness. <laughs> mosquito consciousness, yes. Um, and... Uh, to, to a conversation that we had last week with, with Mark on, on the show, you know, Makunda, uh, you know, and Yogananda as, a, as an avatar incarnate, um, did, he, did he know he had troubles coming and was he in a way more omnipresent about this and he was living through this for our benefit or did he simply, you know, go through these challenges and troubles as we all might, um, but he worked harder, had more willpower and overcame. I'm probably leaning towards the latter, you know, whenever I read this, um, uh, maybe taking it too literally, but, you know, I relate to it. You know, I, I, I read this and think, well, 
you know, he's setting the example. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, we, we, tr we strive to, to do what he does. Mm -hmm. But it was not easy. Any reflections, Mike? Yeah, like you said that in, in Dayananda's ashram, it wasn't all bad for him. And that's, that's like kind of true. Um, but it also showed the difference, like, um, because people could maybe say, oh, Guruji could have found any guru or something. But like it, the, the kind of environment there, the, like, like it was explained earlier, that it was more based on service in this ashram. And so people would keep saying, Mukunda is lazy, Mukunda doesn't mm -hmm. do this, Mukunda doesn't do that. And, and it wasn't, it needs a, um, and Dayananda was often traveling. He wasn't in the, in the hermitage a lot of the time. And so that's why I can imagine um, when he found Sri Yukteswar that he was so happy because there was actually someone who actually was there and he actually cared for his spiritual progress and, not, and nothing else. That's what mm. he cared about. Yeah. So one day when he was uh, obviously meditating, um, what happened was that he found that, or he sensed that his his um, his amulet gifted by his mother was gone. Um, torn by spiritual angu anguish, I entered the attic one dawn, resolved to pray until an answer was vouchsafed. Merciful Mother of the Universe, teach me thyself through visions or through a guru sent by thee the passing hours found my sobbing pleas without a response suddenly i felt lifted as though bodily to a sphere un unsub uncircumscribed and then there was a voice thy master cometh today a divine womanly voice came from everywhere and nowhere and this this sets the now sets the scene for this minute really where we we see him walking into the um, into the marketplace. Um, so I wanted to, I thought it was important to um, reflect on the background of how he came to that or his state of consciousness as he arrived or you know as he was in that marketplace and um, we'll obviously get into that but is there any any other reflections before we get into the marketplace scene chris no no not not really i just um enjoy the the intimate stories that he can share to the detail of which he shares them obviously many years on um and uh yeah it, it's just really insightful really really interesting as far as the imagination yeah, Mike. If you, uh, he, yeah, if you he, have, yeah, he obviously, on. he obviously knew that Dayananda was not his guru, so mm -hmm. because he was in his hermitage and when it all happened, and he was like, no, that's that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so as um, as he as he heard this voice saying, "Thy master cometh today," someone someone yelled at him. I think his name was um, was Habu. And said, "We need to go do some errands. Get out of meditation." And uh, yeah. and then, uh, yeah. But hearing that a divine voice saying, "Thy master cometh today," that's uh, quite a powerful. Yeah. Even that is quite a powerful uh, image, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He, he I think must... it happened. Oh, yeah, go for it. Sorry, Mike. Uh, yeah, for all these years, you know, he's been seeing visions. He's, you know, he's been anticipating this he's wanted to run away to the himalayas <laughs> he's been burning with his desire i you know i imagine in this moment he was pro probably beside himself with excitement and trying to trying to focus his mind to to uh, keep an eye out so he doesn't miss the master that was that was sent <laughs> and it was a womanly voice that came from everywhere and nowhere so because he were, obviously he um he he connects most with the divine mother form doesn't he mm -hmm. and it's consistent with the story that he got the amulet via his mother and and uh, then from there he went to divine mother and yeah. very nice so mike if you haven't got any reflections you want to read the third card elements do, do you know if i could just jump in quick before mike you did, yeah one thing did pop into my mind when when uh, you were reading and it was um Yogananda's determination, you know, he would sit uh, and, and be so determined and demand an answer uh, before uh, before he would, you know, go on to do something different, right? So 
he, he would um, be so steadfast in his ways that I think, um, you know, myself, uh, you know, I'd be guilty of um, not being so committed, you know, in my in my efforts. But time and time again, we see Yogananda would say, you know, I'm not leaving this spot until, you know, I get some kind of a response. Mm. And he, he would get it, you know, this is how he would describe how he goes about it. And that's something that shouldn't be overlooked. You know, it's so important. And he does teach this, you know, be, you know, um, completely focused on what it mm. is you're doing. Uh, and I suppose if you look at other saints or, you know, other, other individuals who, the Buddha being one, I think, sat underneath the, you know, the, the tree and made up his mind. He, he wasn't going to do anything else until he became enlightened. And then, you know, it, it, it happened. So, yeah, it's a small but very important part in that story um, for me. Yeah, I, I, I feel like he was also really upset at this point, Mukunda. Like this was a real expectation of his to find his guru. That is that was like not like something that would be optional in his life. So he it is like if someone loses a loved one or it's like a real strong experience where you then go and say, Okay, God, I need this now. So and then he he just sat down and meditated until he got an answer. Mm. Well, Interesting. He doesn't do that often. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly, you got just going back to the amulet. Um there would have been some sort of something, as Chris said, some sans Sanskrit mantra was written on there. But I tried to find it. Nowhere could I find what was actually written on the amulet. It was, it was not in the autobiography of Yogi. I read a couple of the other, other biographies. It's not in there. So one can only uh, imagine what which uh, mantra. Obviously, uh, personal to to Yogananda and his his life, no doubt. But uh, we don't get to find out so if yeah. listeners have got if listeners if you've got any information juice the information on what was written on the amulet from somewhere some unknown source then we would be most welcome to hear that mm -hmm. chris uh, yeah. mike do you want to read the next bit before we go on or chris got yeah. anything else well, i was just going to add to that you know it'd be super interesting to know um i think yoganand is uh, includes, when he included the some things are better left unsaid uh, sort of sort of line uh, probably hints that uh, the information isn't there but they, there, there is a hint I think before to say that this came through lineages um, in previous lives right so uh, yeah uh, I'm sure it's some, something maybe something to do with that but it mm. would be good to know <laughs> It would be cool to have a picture of the amulet. No, no, we really are. Yeah, go into the Akashic record and ask to see if he might be lucky enough. Yeah. All right. So, 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 yeah, let's get back to the scene. Mike, do you want to read what happened? Okay. Uh, together, Habu and I set out for a distant marketplace in the Bengali section of Benares. The ungentle Indian sun was not yet at zenith as we made our purchases in the bazaars. We pushed our way through the colorful medley of housewives, guides, priests, simply clad windows, dignified Brahmins, and ubiquitous holy bulls. As Habu and I moved on, I turned my head to survey a narrow, inconspicuous lane. A hey, uh... To continue, a Christ-like man in the orca robes of a swami stood motionless at the end of, a of the lane. Instantly and anciently familiar, he seemed for a trice my gauge fed hungrily. Then doubt assailed me. You're confusing this wandering monk with someone known to you. I thought, dreamer, walk on. After 10 minutes, I felt heavy numbness in my feet. As though turned to stone, they were unable to carry me further. Liberously, I turned around. My feet regained normality. I faced the opposite direction. Again, the curious weight oppressed me. This is obviously absolutely phenomenal what we're reading, what we're reading out here. It's so interesting that they couldn't represent this element in the in the film or perhaps they tried and it looked weird they couldn't they couldn't 
they didn't want to just recite the autobiography or something, but they just decided not to. But Mike, I think you were telling me that there was some controversy even in depicting Yogananda and Yukteswar, right? Yeah, I think the in the beginning they started out with a um, they they were trying not to depict Guruji or any of his gurus um, by reenacting any of the scenes and. This is obviously one of the scenes you kind of have to reenact in order to show it. Um, I have to, like, I, I thought about this a lot because like when you see the scene, you you obviously don't see those 10 minutes where where he <laughs> went the other way and then came back. But to be honest, this, this is a kind of, uh, this doesn't lend itself to be a movie content, like going somewhere else and then coming back. I feel like for for movie, this they, uh, they probably, did it the right way maybe not everybody will agree with me but i feel like for the sake of the flow of the film i i feel like they did it in the right way um and in the book the 10 minutes this works much better and because it adds some drama to the to the story obviously it's not a story it happened really happened but i mean <laughs> it still works better in a book than in a movie it's the, it's the age-old um, debate, isn't it? Oh, is, is, is a book better or is the yeah. film depiction better? And in this mm -hmm. case, uh, it's got, we've got the third element of actually it was an autobiography. So it was a story within an autobiography, which is now depicted into a film onto a set. And so it's like three layers of imagination. <laughs> Chris. Yeah. yeah, your mind can build the pictures and, and the video uh, you know, scenes quicker than what uh, what you could actually watch uh, watch it on on a, on a TV screen at times um, and uh, again to me this is interesting because of the uh, more mundane human challenges you know Mukunda's mind playing on him like this like oh dreamer move, walk on like mm. you know you're, you're you're fantasizing and it's curious to me because he had seen his guru's face in visions and yet he was still confused, you know, and even after this message of like, you know, master, the master will come, he, he still tricked himself, you know, and it it's shows to me the power of the mind, you know, and we kind of essentially being tricked and I'm walking on until some, um, I suppose, more higher spiritual uh, effects came into to make his uh, feet turn to concrete as such, <laughs> um, literally stopped him in his path um, because he was, uh, you know, he was he was overplaying it essentially in his mind. Um, it's, it's a really powerful lesson, you know, how many times do, do we trick ourselves into maybe not meditating, just, you know, just do this one thing and, you know, you could do that after you do, do it later or something like this. It's, to my mind, similar principles, hmm. you know, if you, if you allow yourself being tricked, you you will you will be tricked. Yeah. Can you I guys think... imagine? Yeah, okay. go on. Yeah, go on. Can you guys imagine the whole story from the perspective of, of Sri Yukteswar? He probably got up in the morning <laughs> and walked by the Ganges and then Divine Mother said, Oh yeah, your student Yogananda will come today. And you just stand here in this lane and then she tells him he's gonna come now. And then, <laughs> and then he comes. And looks at and you and keeps walking. <laughs> <laughs> you really? Maybe not. Not the way he envisaged. Maybe then, then he goes like, Divine Mother, what's happening? What's going on? Mm, that's so, a, that's so, a good, so good point. Uh, but, you know, I, I like the, um, the, the story of the way that they've done this, you know, no doubt Sri Yukteswar was for probably directly involved with turning, his, you know, concretizing his legs when mm. he looked in that direction, obviously, because he was, he saw him and he, as Mike said, he would, he would have like said, what are you doing? This is, this is the direction you need to come. But the, I, I, there's a parallel obviously with this story in, in literature and in phrase and in sayings like you know we, we often say oh you know I was so nervous my legs turned to jelly and in this case he was going in the wrong direction so his legs turned into concrete and you know we and, and to Chris's point we often see signs 
um, of the direction we should lead our lives and go in, 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 in certainly in certain, certain pinch, pinch points of what we should do and, you know, epoch moments of our lives, I suppose. And we, we, we often don't listen or don't see the signs. And this is coming back to like the alchemist and things like that. Um, but it's, it's usually not as clear as your legs turning to concrete, but certainly mm -hmm. you, do, you do have the signs and you just have to be, you have to really work hard on your intuition and your devotion and your perception to be able to grasp those signs. What do you think, Chris? There is something monumentous about the occasion for Yogananda that um, I think maybe it was played up uh, almost too much in his, his mind. You know, he's, he's literally calling himself a dreamer. <laughs> what, does, what does that imply? It's like, well, it's fantasy. It's some kind of uh, faux reality. It's, it's not, mm. you, you know, you're, you're not really being realistic. You know, you're, you're, you're making up fantasizing um which you know is to say there's some there's something powerful to that that i heard uh, how people take care of their cats and dogs and their animals better than they take care of themselves and that is there's something innate there maybe that um you know do we deserve what we have and all the good stuff and there's so much kind of guilt and sin on, on, on our minds subconsciously and in society that maybe we don't simply take the best path and the righteous, the most optimum path to, to God, uh, then what we should, you know, and like I said, like the devil, if the, the devil is due, you know, it does a very good job of distracting us to, you know, to, to veer off the path uh, at times um, in very subtle ways. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, can't, I love this story. It's very, it's very honest, you know, um, and it's very open um and uh just just shows uh to to me to to what you're saying Priyank, you know uh there's so many little uh quips in your life that uh, you, if you're paying attention to uh and simply following your intuition you would you'd be living a lot more simplistic beautiful lovely life uh, as god intended you know do you have um hey go on mike yeah yeah i i like i like the idea but it's I feel like it's not so easy, right? Because those signs, they don't always come. And sometimes we mistake something that just happens with a sign. And it takes real discrimination to, to pick them apart. And when Guruji says, dreamer, walk on, I feel like he might have mistaken a lot of things already for, mm -hmm. oh, this is it mm -hmm. now. And he was a bit discouraged from the experiences he had earlier, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And now when it actually happens to him, he's like, okay, no, <laughs> when it then actually ha happens, he didn't expect it at all, kind of, even though the voice told him you're going to meet your guru today. Do you ever, do you ever go in hindsight and go, oh yeah, I should have done that. Actually, that was a sign back then. Like an idiot, I ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me? Yeah. yeah. That's my life. Sorry my life. <laughs> <laughs> I just summed his life up there. <laughs> my, my, my dad and I have this running kind of uh, dialogue between between each other um, where, oh, you know, I, I knew I should have done this and I did that. And if only I'd, I had to listen to the little voice in the back of my mind. And uh, as the years have gone by, you know, this has happened many, many times. And my dad is always one to say, listen, you know, listen to this intuition, pay attention to it. But it's only recently until I kind of, you know, got closer at least to seeing that for what it is. And the the uh, truth might be simply in the in the words you used, you know, the, the voice in the back of your head, the voice in your back of mind, where, where's the bindula when got it? It's in the back of your head, you know, and this is the, the mouth of God, right? So this is maybe the, the, the wisdom of God, the, the knowledge coming through speaking to you very subtly you know not in words but just in, in pure uh, intention that you know and you, you pick these things up but it's not written somewhere in physical 3d form so you you, you, you don't trust it enough um so yeah i, I have this dialogue to my, to my dad you know you listen to the, the the man in the back of your head more and you, you'll you'll be happier but um it applies to everything right so um you know we um 
we, we can use it in, in business, in our professional work. Uh, this isn't just, you know, spiritual in, in a sense that, um, you know, making the right or wrong turns in meditation or whatnot. It is literally in everyday life, um, maybe even to get you out of trouble, you know, to turn down one street and another to avoid a confrontation. You know, we are at some level spirit and omnipresent. And so if if we pay attention to it more, who knows where we can go in, in life and what, what we can do uh, and have wealth in, in all aspects in, in its truest yeah. form. Yep, that's a good point, uh, Chris, and about the other, you know, other aspects of your life and using it for that as well. But in, in on that point, do you ever, I, I've, I've been doing this a lot more recently in my life. So if there's a difficult or challenging obstacle or hurdle to be jumped or overcome, I let it settle. I let it like really like let the thinking about a process, I like go away from it and take a day, take two days, take three days and let it just be at the back of my mind. And all the noise of like, you know, all the emotional response to those things obviously lead you to many different directions. But when all of that dies down, then you can come to a place of like really pure um, rationalization um, and trying to read the situation in its purest form without all your psychological clutter. And then it, the, then at that point, then the solution is just one solution. This is for all the, given all the variables, this is the way that I should be going. And, you know, we're going to get to, you're going to end the turning, turning around now, but that, I, I feel that, 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 that you can use that principle in, in your daily life as well. So in, in this, in Yogananda has reflected for 10 minutes, you know, this, this, have this scene that was occurring for 10 minutes for him. And that's quite a long time, isn't it? If, if that was true, 10 minutes of pondering, oh, I, to come, I want to go this way. No, my legs, what's happening? I've cramp, you know, 10 minutes of that. That was quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, y Yogananda talks about um, uh, observing life's troubles with a calm mind and observing it calmly, the, the truth will reveal itself to you. Um, Priyanka, I know you're, you're quite keen on chess. Uh, <laughs> how many times in chess could you say, if you lose your cool and lose your calm, uh, you know, you, you soon lose a piece or you lose a pawn or something um, and, you, you know, you lose the game. Uh, and, you know, keeping calm in, in all circumstances is, uh, is worthwhile. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you know, it, I, I haven't been to India, but I've heard it's a very frantic place and the chaos of these markets and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> maybe the chaos of that was uh, enough to stir the calmness of the moment. Yeah. Uh, Mike, any thoughts on what I just said about uh, letting things cool and then having a clear path? Yeah, it's definitely the, the, the more mature way of handling things. It is completely counter to what the mind wants to do. The mind always wants a fast solution mm. and that it's always, always the road to perdition. So it's never a good thing to do um, because the, the emotions that guide you, they are not, most of the times, they're not really the thing that, that you should follow. Like it doesn't say anywhere in scriptures, oh yeah, your emotions, they're great. Like follow those. <laughs> but it's like the what it's like the wisdom and the intuition that you should follow and neither of those are represented by your emotions um and it's it's even worse i feel like your emotions are like your super short-term instincts that you have and they would lead you to repeating a mistake over and over and over and over again um and that Second point would be that sometimes problems, they just solve themselves if you wait a bit. So <laughs> you don't need to do anything some of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there was a, a precedent uh, just to throw this story in because I thought it was interesting. I can't be specific, unfortunately, with the, with the story. So uh, there was a president um, whose name, I think it might have been Truman, um, who used to simply close his eyes and, and um, uh, before he would make a decision and you know when you're sitting at a, a boardroom 
uh, meeting and getting tons of information. There's high stress. You're having to make critical decisions. I think, I think it was this uh, president of the United States used to close his eyes before making a decision. And when I, when I read that, I thought it was really significant because it's so un, unusual. Uh, and imagine, you know, you're, you're in this corporate kind of setup and somebody really takes, takes that moment of calm to kind of shut out the the uh, the, the uh, perceptions uh, and, and try to go within uh, and you know be calm. I, I just like that story as well, and maybe it links to this uh, in some way. Um, it takes a lot of bravery or a lot of courage to do that, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, to, to not worry too much about how this is perceived, but simply to try to do the right thing in that moment. Um, yeah. Yeah, just to, just to cap off that point, then sometimes when I, you know, the the imperfectness of my meditation, in that you know you, you sometimes have thoughts and you're trying to bat them away and cool them down, but that imperfection, like say I'm in this three day cooling off period, then the the drop of the right solution would just kind of sit straight into my meditation of like oh yeah that's what I'm supposed to do in that thing I was thinking about three days ago even though like I wasn't thinking about it it would just come into me whilst I'm meditating because my meditation isn't perfect but uh yeah then I'd really I'd, I'd really enjoy that because then as soon as my meditation's over I'm like yeah I know what I want to do in that that uh aspect mm -hmm. of my life now <laughs> yeah the secret weapon of uh, meditation is clearing the clutter of the mind and yeah, yeah. anybody can apply that <laughs> let's move uh, swiftly on to the next part of the story so the saint is magnetically drawing me to him with this thought i heaped my parcels into the arms of harbu he had been observing my erratic footwork with amazement and now burst into laughter <laughs> What ails you? Are you crazy? My tumultuous emotion prevented any retort. I sped silently away, retracing my steps as though winged shod. I reached the narrow lane. My quick glance revealed the quiet figure, steadily gazing in my direction. A few eager steps, and I was at his feet. Guru Dev. The divine face was one I had seen in a thousand visions. Those halcyon eyes in a leonine head with a pointed beard and flowing locks had oft peered through the gloom of my nocturnal reveries, holding a promise I had not fully understood. So this Christ-like man, as he describes him, certainly fits the bill doesn't it well that description is perfect um how, how do you how did you receive that lovely moment in the film and the autobiography mike yeah like you said earlier priyank in the autobiography it, they make a bigger deal out of it or he makes a bigger deal out of it as in the film um i mean it like the the previous maybe five chapters lead up to this, or maybe the whole book leads up to this moment in a way. Um, and it's such a, such a great moment. He finally found his guru. And it is, um, I, I feel like, like we talk, talked about this earlier, how important this is in a seeker's life and someone who wants to find God, this is, this is one of the, the major milestones. One, once, you, once you found your guru, um, I mean, you, that doesn't mean you have arrived at God yet, but it means you have someone who took the responsibility of you to take you there, which is amazing. And for everyone who is following the path of, of uh, self SRF and of Yogananda, um, they, are, they know what they have when they say they have a guru. And the, so the whole meaning of guru wasn't like something that, because um, growing up in Austria, I didn't really know what this meant. And this, this kind, of, kind of exemplifies how, what an enormous deal it is to have a guru, basically. Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this must be for Yogananda so refreshing. 
right? You know, he's waited so long for this moment. And the ecstasy that I'm sure he would have experienced that at the, at the uh, you know, being able to cast his eyes on the on the physical form, on, on the gaze of his guru, you know, if we could do that with Yogananda himself, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure it would be spectacular. Um, so the, the moment for him must have been very, very special. Um, and it describes it very, very beautifully, doesn't it? And there's a calm grace and poise uh, of Sri Yukteswar. Uh, and describing him uh, as the, uh, um, is it like a lion almost, you know, like his mane, you know, his, his uh, form is, represents his courage and his bravery but his, you know he's got discipline as well that Yogananda learns from him this form must have been you know so great to lay eyes on you know uh, for, especially for Yogananda um, you know so so the pictures that we see of for Yogteshwar every time I see it it strikes me every single time you know his eyes is we talked about this before haven't we you know the, almost the discipline that you <laughs> you feel from him just by looking upon a picture um, is awesome. Uh, so seeing him in, in a physical form would have been would have been really special uh, as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll weigh in. So the, the so th this starts a section of the of the film which really throws a lot of a lot of a devotional element of the, the feeling of that moment and. This 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 is the scene where it starts it, and I think the film does a fantastic job. I think, and this is where I think films can be more powerful than than books because in this element they have, you know, they have like chanting. They've got Orm that's chanting in the background. There's like hazy scenes. There's you know you you see you're gonna um, um, you're gonna end the kneeling to his feet. Um, you see. You know, there's one thing imagining it and then seeing it is obviously a different um, different experience. So I think in this element, I think the, the film does a really, really superb job capturing the feeling from this the, from this point into the next one or two minutes, their first encounter and their first meeting and their first communication. But um, let, let's talk about a little bit about the last few words. So, and this is also in the film. He says that... Um, this meeting was was holding a promise I had not fully understood. So, what do you think this promise was that he had not understood? Either of you, this uh, this faith, this expression that he was looking at, or you know, this meeting, um, his eyes, whatever, whatever it was that he might be referring to. Do you, either of you I, has it a gift? I think on, it, Mike? I think it was what I was just talking about earlier. It was this the responsibility of the guru to to take you to the infinite and go with you all the way and mm -hmm. never never leave your side and this is like somewhere else in in the book guruji describes the the relationship between a guru and a disciple as one of the highest relationships that you can have in an earthly environment and uh, maybe that's what he was talking about i'm just speculating Mm. Chris, yeah, it's, it's nice. Um, yeah, just to build on that, it's the it's the, for, the the promise, you know, it's the the, um, the 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 contractual spiritual contractual agreement. You know, we literally make as devotees with our guru um, to go through lives of incarnations until we become self-realized, and we know later in, in uh, the relationship with uh, Sri Yukteswar and, and Yogananda. When Yogananda is ready, Sri Yukteswar gives him certain experiences. Uh, and those experiences, Yogananda might not understand at this point in the, uh, in the uh, story, let's say, but um, the mysteries of life uh, you know, are, are endless. Um, uh, and uh, you know, Sri Yukteswar certainly has been there uh, to, to guide Yogananda um, so yeah, the, the mysteries or promises not yet understood simply because uh, Sri Yukteswar is there to shine light along this very uh, narrow and treacherous path that we all follow 
Um, so that's what I think, you know, it, it is. He's, the, the guru, the definition of a guru, right, is to, Priyank jump in on this or Mike jump in on this, but simply as the, 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 the person who sheds, sheds light, brings light. Um, dispels uh, darkness, you know. Dispels darkness. Mm -hmm. Dispels yep. darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in darkness, it's um, the, the kind of fear of the unknown, isn't it? So the promise of, you know, things yet not understood is, how can you understand something if you can't see it, if you can't know it? So the guru is there to, to shed that light, to dispel the darkness. Yep. Some of the other dialogue in this uh, scene was that, I uh, paraphrase, Mukunda says he's seen Suryuteshwar's face in many dreams and visions. And in this, to portray that, they have like Yukteshwar's like face, his, the actual image of Yukteshwar, not the actor, just uh, in kind of in the clouds and the mountains. Um, this, this is in, in also in conjunction with the Aum chanting that we have in the background and the Dampur, I think that that's also playing. So really, really, really very magical um, magical portrayal of that uh, that moment of the of Yogananda's life. Um, so he also says something along the lines of like he knew him before he had met him. Um, let's talk about that. So how can you know someone before you've met them, Mike? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's an there's another story of a disciple finding his guru. And they know know each other from previous lifetimes in the autobiography, right? And it's the one of Babaji and Lahiri mm. Mahashai. And they go into great detail on this, on that relationship, um, where he says, like, see, this is your cup where you were drinking from, and this is where you this is where you meditated and everything. And maybe it's easier if you are in the same physical environment to to kind of get your memories back but he does guruji does say that he um he like some some memories came back to him and i was wondering what kind of memories would they be because they just met right so maybe there were previous life memories of each other um and i am not sure if they ever uh, talk about this anywhere um, who they might have been in their previous incarnations and what their relationship was. And, but um, another point I want to make is that that seems to be a recurring theme that, that guru-disciple relationships repeat each other through lifetimes. And sometimes they go in reverse. Um, and that is also something that could have happened that in another life that Yogananda was the guru and Sri Yukteswar was mm -hmm. the disciple. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah with, uh, but, uh, with jesus christ and john the baptist right yeah yeah exactly and elijah and El elisa mm. or what their name was <laughs> yeah so that's but i i don't i don't think there's really much known about who they were in their previous lives listeners can uh, weigh in on that one yeah. chris any any reflections yeah yeah that's that's really nice um uh you know i i um i i think it's there, there's definitely something to uh, the relationship with the, the, the guru and disciple um, that, uh, yeah, one, one day we might know the full extent of um, should we uh, should we be in the position to to, to uh, be granted that knowledge. Um, but but really, uh, I, I think um, the what Mike said was absolutely bang on. It was you know correct uh, in, by my measure. Um, so not, not much to add to it. Uh, uh, to, to okay. um, so that pretty much uh, caps off the minute. Um, there's obviously a few other elements. So when you when he approaches Sri Yukteswar, Yukteswar's arms are kind of arms, hands are out facing facing Yogananda, and um, and Yogananda kneels down and you know touches touches Sri Yukteswar's feet. Um, so again, that's uh, very, very magically portrayed in, in, in the film. And um, I think that's uh, one of the, probably one of the, that little element of this coming minute is probably one of the best minutes, I think, for me in, in, in the film and how it's portrayed and, and, and further concrete or like enhanced my understanding of some of the, the most critical scenes of, of our guru's 
earthly incarnation in this in this in this particular life so that's that's pretty much it for the minute is there any other elements that you want to bring up for me yes actually there's two things there's the om chanting that we didn't really delve into because actually this is a really significant part in in uh, in yoga uh, as far as the srf teachings go as we know the uh, om chanting listening to the to the right ear um, and chanting om and uh, that's a, that's a practice um, that uh, I think we all hold hold dear, and it's very significant. And th there was uh, one thing that's always struck me about this, uh, and it was uh, reading um, the Bible, uh, I think John chapter one. I, I can't remember. Um, uh, it, it said that you know first um, or in the beginning there, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. Um, or in the word was God, uh, I think. Um, and Om is such a powerful uh, sound that um, we can connect to that is used really nicely here to, to your comment, Brian, um, because it ties in with, with what we're taught uh, with SRF. And I suppose we could maybe look at that a little bit more, what, what it is and um, how it can be used if, if you'd like, but Certainly, the listeners, you know, if they're SRF practitioners, they'll know all about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, be, it should be very uh, fun. Uh, Mike, do you want to have a go at describing it in oh, the, no. the limited, the limit, <laughs> the limited way that we're allowed? In fact, we're not obviously allowed yeah. to talk about the techniques themselves. Too much. Um, yeah. So let's start with Ohm. Ohm is like this. This sound that created all of creation right and um but it's also used as a sound to to worship deities and worship your guru so om guru is like something that is being used very often and it's like holds some kind of spiritual significance when you when you chant it just by itself when you just say om it's definitely something that moves the energy up in your spine and and gets the attention up into the higher centers um but um to be honest like the i'm not a great scientific expert on what what it actually what it actually what it actually does the the ohm technique in by that is taught in srf is obviously something we can talk about but yeah it is something that helps you become one with um with the with the idea of ohm and ohm is is ultimately it is god uh, um as he created creation basically yeah so christ consciousness or the the holy ghost isn't it is described as the ohm vibration in in that's manifest in all all creation and so each i think Yogananda describes um, in the autobiography and and other books the the various astral sounds that um, that can be heard by an adept mm. yogi, and this is why in this scene, uh, and this is this is a this is not like a physical sound that you hear. It's a it's like a metaphysical sound that you can perceive, and in in this you know there's various. There's, there's there's like the flute, the harp, and and there's all sorts of other ones associated with the different different chakras, and we in this scene the tampur is played. So there's one note, you know, on the tampur that's played, and the om is attached to that frequency. So it, I, that's why I think it's a very very powerful part of the um, of the film because not only have they got the imagery spot on and perfect, they've got the sound and the significance of our meditation practices and in, in, in what we're actually trying to achieve it's all in it's all right there so it's it's touching virtually every single nerve and sinew of our connection with um with yogananda personally that's that's my take on it is that satisfactory chris it is indeed it is absolutely <laughs> thank you Greg. The, the other thing that I, I wanted to mention here was um the picture of Sri Teshwar came with him sitting in lotus posture. And um, 
again, it's it's something that we see often with gurus, lineages of SRF. You know, you see uh, Babaji, um, Yogananda himself, the Hirni Mahashaya, all sitting in, in lotus postures with pictures. Um, I, you know, I for one can say, I when I started meditating, I couldn't sit on my backside on the floor, you know, with uh, with any kind of posture because of my uh, topness, you know, and it took a long time, year, year and a half, sitting, trying to breathe, you know, releasing the tension, you know, the, the back was very, very tight. And so lotus posture just was impossible, you know, it just wasn't was possible. But over time, you know, it, it's, it's coming, but um, there is a significance to this. And I just wondered if you guys knew what it was, maybe, Mike, you're nodding your head. What's, uh, I, what, what can you tell I, us? I, I'm not sure if I read that um, in um, SRF literature or somewhere else, but the yoga, the yoga posture is supposed to be this posture that is like, uh, allows the perfect flow of energy in your body. And it's really helpful that if you have any disease or anything, this flow of energy will maximize the healing power of your, of your own life energy. Um, and I'm sure it's also helpful during meditation, um, even though I personally am not able to do the lotus posture, um, but I, all the great masters are using it. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't 100% sure where this information was in the SRF text or literature. So if any listeners um, are enlightened uh, enough to share it with us, please, please do because um, I basically I resorted to Google searching, but pray maybe. Yes. Maybe so chapter six, verse 12 of God talks with Arjuna talks about oh, the Lotus posture directly. And the, the reason I know that is because I just did a reading <laughs> Chris <laughs> yesterday on that, um, on our, one of our channels. And uh, yeah, it talks about the significance of that posture as, and, and it alludes to what Mike was saying. And you're going to also goes into detail about the, the flow of energy and things like that and how you can insulate from yourself from the earth currents because obviously that we're trying to go to uh, the higher higher state so he talks about even uh, what you should place underneath your um, yourself as you're meditating but he also talks about the fact that as chris was saying westerners would struggle uh, and i include myself in that to sit and lotus posture or on the floor for any length of time so you know sitting on the chair with um you know with your with your back straight your shoulder, shoulder blades back your chin parallel to the ground these are all the substitutes if you like for those that can't sit in the padmasana which is the full lotus posture or aradrasadasana which is the half lotus where only one leg comes over your upper thigh that I can do for a while, but not mm -hmm. not for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chris, do you have any other info on that? No, I think I think that was you know really you, you guys hit the um, hit the main points there. Uh, it's just funny how it's actually meant to strengthen uh, parts of your body, your your um, you know your ankles and so on and so forth. But you know if you if you Google it, which I did. Um, you know, you see tons of articles saying, oh, it's bad for your knees, it's bad for your hips, it's bad for your ankles, it's bad for everything, don't do it, you know. Um, but, uh, but yet, you know, there's, there's so much uh, positive uh, and meaning behind it um, that, uh, you, know, you know, if, if you are able to do it, practice, you know, connect with your breathing. Um, but yes, uh, channeling the, the energy, the uh, channel uh, up and down the spine, uh, it's it's meant to have that um, uh, the circuit essentially is, is meant to be stronger. Um, that's that's what I got from it. So yeah, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, it's just funny you, you would very easily see that and think, oh yeah, that's something the gurus do. But you know, unless you sit, say, well, why you know, ask the question, you can miss it, skip past it. Mike, any last points? Okay. Uh, I have to correct myself. It was chapter six, verse eleven, not twelve. So if you want to read more about, if you want to, are you going to correct me? If you want to read more about that, then you can go to that uh, that page. Any so any more for any more? No, it's uh, it's lovely, lovely. Thank minute. you, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a joy. Jay Guru, see you next time. <laughs>